All right. Um, thanks a lot for joining, everybody. Um, let me play this. Uh, so uh, we're going to be talking about uh, building efficient and reliable data lakes using Iceberg. A um, little bit about us. Hey there. Uh -huh. My name is Anton. I'm part of Apple Cloud Services, and my recent focus is on building data lakes. I'm PMC for Apache Iceberg and Apache Spark contributor. Thank you. Uh, my name is Vishwa. I manage, uh, I'm the engineering manager uh, and lead here. I manage data orchestration and data lake um, in, in Apple Cloud Services. We are part of the data orchestration and data lake team here um, as part of uh, our data platform organization. Uh, we primarily focus on Apache Spark, Iceberg, and Airflow. Uh, so that's kind of, uh, that's about us. Uh, agenda, we're going to be talking a bit about uh, data infrastructure at Apple, what we've been doing, uh, our efforts towards modernization of data infrastructure at Apple, um, the current status. Uh, we did have a chat, we did have another talk just before this at uh, 9.15, where we talked about um, what are the upsets and updates related use cases, uh, and the current status of Spark and Iceberg at Apple. So I won't go into that again here, but a little bit of history and the current status of overall data platform. Um, Anton would talk about uh, why Apache Iceberg, what next, and 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 some key takeaways uh, after that. Um, data infrastructure at Apple, um, not surprisingly, has been um, built on on has been traditionally built on Hadoop ecosystem for a very long time. For the last several years, we have modernized the infrastructure here and we provide Spark as a service, Iceberg as a service, and so on. I'll come to that part of things. But uh, historically, a uh, lot of data engineering and data science has happened on Hadoop ecosystem. We have multiple exabytes of data stored on Hadoop uh, and HDFS today. And from a compute perspective, we have a few million cores worth of compute that happens on top, on top of Hadoop. Um, uh, has been happening for, uh, for a very long time. Um, typically, how it, it worked out is you, you have a team, you have a new use case, Apple is launching a new product, there's going to be new data that's going to be coming in, so team gets a Hadoop cluster. Um, as you can see here, this is an example Hadoop cluster with about, with about 120 petabytes of data here. Um, over the period of time, you figure out that this particular Hadoop cluster is extremely high on compute. There is no compute resource left, but very low on storage this is a pattern that we see over and over again for the last several years as we have provided spark as a service on a compute substrate uh, one thing we have figured out is if you get a hadoop cluster the you get some amount of storage and compute but the compute that you get along hadoop cluster is never enough it's it, you usually uh, as a thumb of rule need at least three times more compute than what you would get in a hadoop cluster so uh, as you can see the the it's very high on computer utilization. What do you do? The team would get one more Hadoop cluster. And you copy the data over using the CP, and then you do Spark jobs or, or other kind of processing on, on that Hadoop cluster, and you copy the data back. Over the period of time, what happens is this gets full because there's a lot of data that's lying around. It's not being deleted correctly. Uh, it's it's only a subset of compute moved from the first cluster to here, but it's extremely high on storage utilization. Um, so obviously you get one more cluster. Uh, you can, of course, delete it, prune it. There are use cases for which you need to probably store the data for long and you have stored it for a very long time. So you get one more Hadoop cluster. As you can see, the generation of Hadoop clusters that we have gotten here are slightly bigger and bigger in size. Not extremely large, but about 20 petabytes bigger and bigger here. So again, you copy the data over from the other two clusters, just so you can you can do compute on this and copy the data back. So this kind of proliferation uh, is something that we have seen for a very, very long time. Um, some obvious disadvantages of this are, this is extremely high operational costs because number of Hadoop clusters 
become a lot more and more. Uh, there's tremendous amount of wastage of resources because you either use compute or you use storage. If it's a compute heavy workload, if, if it is a compute heavy use case, then there's extremely large amount of compute that's used and storage is hardly used. There's duplication of data. So you copy the data over and it's, it's quite hard to delete the data track the data and delete it once the usage is over. Use cases like GDPR needs extremely uh, uh, high amounts of tooling and orchestration in order to find out all the data sets that have been generated, slightly different data sets that have been generated over the period of time in a huge form of Hadoop cluster uh, clusters. So it's also very hard to govern because every time you copy the data over to the new cluster, you have to set up author authentication authorization, make sure it's encrypted, make sure only that part of data set is visible to only a subset of users, a uh, subset of data scientists, and not all data is visible to them. So it's quite hard to govern. So this is only about data engineering and data science. And, and this doesn't, uh, to some extent, cover what would happen with uh, ad hoc and SQL use cases. And, and for that, what do you do? You get a system like Teradata or Vertica or something like that because you need extremely fast queries back. And of course, you copy data from all these clusters onto a system like that. And then, and then that becomes a legacy monolithic, uh, monolithic system and it becomes extremely hard to manage and upgrade uh, a system like that. So overall, this has been the state of uh, uh, of data proliferation at Apple when, when we started off uh, with data platform uh, development. And over the period of time, we have uh, made sure that we shift some of this based on few core principles, basically. Um, one of the first things that we did was we made sure that disaggregation is one of the most important principle for us, which means that we would disaggregate the storage and compute having them together has some benefits like locality, which becomes more and more hard as, as data proliferates and the compute that you need is no longer enough on a particular cluster that becomes somewhat irrelevant. So disaggregating storage and compute has multiple advantages. You can expand storage separately, um, uh, add more and more uh, distributed uh, file systems there and expand compute separately so that you can add uh, compute resources separately. Spark uh, for all data engineering purposes. Uh, today, Apple uses Spark for all uh, batch and streaming use cases and, and all use cases related to data engineering. So Spark for all data engineering. So, and, and the next step for us was to make sure that we solve, we, solve the, we solve some of the use cases that Teradata, Vertica, and systems like that support today, which is to have one-stop data lake engine that can, that can be extremely fast and, and provide um, the set of um, requirements, uh, provide the solution for set of requirements that we have. So just to visually look at what I said, we would have storage, which is either HDFS or S3 or S3-like object stores, which we can expand out separately. Then we have a compute substrate that's built on top of Kubernetes, uh, a little bit on Mesos, on which you run Apache Spark. We have been modernizing from Mesos infrastructure to Kubernetes infrastructure as well. And we have a lot of use cases that run on Kubernetes infrastructure today. Uh, Spark is great, but um, what makes Spark really smarter and also adds some of the data lake features that we want is Apache Iceberg. So we provide Spark as a service. And from the perspective of Apache Iceberg, we have a project called Data Tables. We internally call the product called data tables. And that's uh, that provides the uh, data lake uh, abstraction and data lake features. The other thing that Spark is not really good at is being able to share the same sh session or being able to run multiple queries from multiple users at the same time. Uh, there are use cases where um, uh, many of the teams uh, attempt to run um, one notebook or multiple notebooks using the same a Spark session and submit jobs uh, or submit queries on the same Spark session. And Spark has a very rudimentary scheduling mechanism because of which it cannot scale. And what you need really here is a solid um, query engine. And that's where we provide Presto as a service as well. 
So we have Apache Iceberg, we have integrations with Spark and Presto SQL internally. And for multi-user multi query support, we use Presto, which is, um, uh, which, is extreme, which is exclusively for queries. And Spark is a general purpose data processing engine where you can do ingestion, you can do queries, you can do a copy of data, you can do, you can generate newer data sets and, and such as well. On top of it, we have a unified data science catalog, which kind of keeps track of all the data sets that we generate. It keeps track of which data set is generated from uh, the parent data set, who has access to this particular data set, which columns are are um, which columns are uh, encrypted? Which columns are uh, accessible to a particular user group? And everything related to that is is stored in unified data science catalog. Uh, over that, we have built user experience in the form of notebooks, user interfaces. We have our own user interface. Our users have built their own uh, dashboards and other user interfaces using our APIs that we provide on top of this. So this is how our data infrastructure uh, looks at Apple. Uh, looks at Apple currently, and we've been um, slowly migrating off of Hadoop infrastructure onto this modernized data infrastructure here. Uh, focusing on Iceberg here, so that we can talk a little bit about data lakes. Uh, uh, the primary, primarily, we have three main requirements right, to those of which we need uh, to build data lake. One, we need uh, extreme mass blazing fast queries. This is no surprise, everybody wants it. Um, uh, we tend to use different solutions for it. Some, we, we, we use um, Teradata and Vertica, things like that. And slowly there has been a migration off of it so that there's no window lock-in. It's easier to uh, upgrade. It's, it's easier to have one copy of data so that you don't have to copy data from HDFS onto systems like Teradata um, for, for SQL purposes. So you have one data set that you can use uh, through Spark or through Presto, or you can use for data engineering, data science, or for SQL ad hoc SQL use cases. This next one is transactional updates. Um, one thing that is for sure is we do have, we have a lot of data at Apple and, and most of this data, a large part of this data needs to be updated as well. There are use cases like uh, sessionization, deduplication for which we'll need to go back and update the data basically. Um, uh, there are also scenarios where we need deletes. So we need transactional updates and deletes. Um, and when we looked at um, what problems we have in order to solve this, there, there used to be a huge amount of data engineering jobs and data engineering infrastructures that were built on top in order to solve the simple problem of uh, our transactional updates. And it didn't provide any transactionality either. So transactional update is quite important for us. We want to be able to read data as it gets updated. Uh, and update data in multiple threads. And that's something that's possible today uh, using Apache Iceberg. Automatic compaction is quite important as well. Um, what's, if, if you look at HDFS or if you look at S3, one of the most prevalent problems is the problem with small files. Um, you get a lot of small files and you, you try to run jobs that uh, basically merge them at some point in time. What we do today as part of data tables and Iceberg project is we provide a service that automatically compacts the data and metadata. So um, users can simply choose to run it on a cadence or, or run it on partitions that are just updated uh, and, and not touch the rest of the data. So these are the three main requirements that we were behind in order to build a data lake for us. Um, and, and we chose uh, Apache Iceberg as, as the software that could, that could do this. Um, the next section of this uh, presentation is gonna be talking about why we chose Iceberg, what are the features that are there, how and, and that's something that Anton would cover. Uh, I'll hand this over to Anton now. Anton? Thanks, Vishra. Um, let me share my screen. All right, so in the next section, I will cover, um, I will deep dive into iceberg features and why I think they are so essential for any modern data lake. And that's the reason why we decided to adopt Apache Iceberg. And the first point that is really important for us is that Iceberg is an open table format um, that was meant for huge analytical data sets 
and it comes with a clear specification and it was designed to be integrated into different query engines. Um, the goal of a table format is to define how you should lay out individual data files and bundle them up to have a concept of a table. And the de facto standard table format that's currently built in query engines like Spark or Presto is the high table format. It usually means there is a central matter sort that tracks a list of partitions for your table. And whenever you need to know which files are inside those partitions, you have to perform the list operation. Um, this has a number of problems with respect to performance and correctness. And Icebrick was designed to solve those problems and bring your data lakes to the next level. Um, Icebrick also was designed to fit into the existing ecosystem. Um, it has a core library and a proper API that multiple query engines can reuse. It supports multiple file formats, so you can use either Parquet, Avro, or RFC. Um, it came originally with support for Spark, Presto, and Pig, and now the community is actively working on Dremio, Hive, and Flink integration, so there are actually something you can try right now for proof of concept with those frameworks, and I'm really excited by that. Um, to give a bit of history, Iceberg was, start, was started by Netflix um, in August 2017, as, uh, and from the first day, it was an open source project. In November 2018, it was donated to the Apache Software Foundation, where it became part of the incubator. And in May 2020, we actually graduated from this, uh, in, from the incubator. And one of the reasons for, for the graduation is that we had a very strong technical community um, led by people from Netflix, Apple, LinkedIn, Adobe, um, Tencent, Alibaba, and many other companies. So we have Presto folks and Dremio folks who are actually participating in the core design decisions here. And um, apart from that, we have a lot of PMC members in Hadoop, um, Spark, Flink. We have PMC members from um, uh, Parquet, Avro, or C and others as well. So it makes it really a great place to be. And the way we handle all the technical discussions is also very important. Another important, really important point for us is that Iceberg was designed to reduce the load on the object store or distributed file system. There is zero list operation to plan a job, to commit a new table version, or even to perform most of the table management operations such as expiring all snapshots. And it is hard to overestimate the importance of this decision if you run in systems like S3 where you don't have consistent lists and where the list in itself can take hours on large tables or where you don't have atomic rename operation. And believe me, there are so many systems with the same characteristics that are out there. And for us, it was really important that Iceberg would solve this problem. Um, because there is no requirement for a consistent list operation or um, atomic rename, Iceberg allows you to uh, have full asset compliance on any objects toward distributed file system. You don't need to run solutions like S3 where you don't have to keep part of your metadata in a consistent storage. Um, you don't have to uh, deal about optimizing lists in your metadata folder. You don't have to reason about how to work around um, eventual consistency and, and many other problems that you would actually normally have. And in addition, what is really important is that um, Iceberg provide full, uh, provides full asset compliance uh, for writes and reads from multiple clusters and from multiple query engines. So this means you can have a Spark notebook, um, a Presto cluster, and a compaction job interacting with the same table reliably. And I think this is a fundamental feature to have because right now uh, the ecosystem is very diverse. Um, this actually enables to, to use, uh, for example, Dremio or Presto for ad hoc analytics, Flink for data ingestion, and then Spark with some heavy ETL or batch processing. And as, as you saw earlier, we actually kind of leverage that principle uh, a lot internally. Um, Iceberg relies on optimistic concurrency, which means that if there are two operations that are happening at the same time, only one of them will be successful. The second, uh, the second one will retry, but that retry will be implicit to the user and it will be done on the metadata level. And we will reuse all of the work 
during the first unsuccessful attempt in most cases. Um, and if the second, if Iceberg detects that the second commit is not in conflict, it will be able to commit it successfully. And the conflict detection and resolution is done on the file level, which is even better than partition level, so that you can modify the same partition concurrently and still commit those operations. And the reason for that is because Iceberg keeps metadata for every single data file, and it actually contains min-max statistics for every file in the in the metadata so that it can actually resolve those conflicts uh, on the file level. The next feature I wanna talk about is indexing. Um, Iceberg brings the well-known idea of small materialized aggregates to the next level. It persists the min-max statistics for your columns per file in its own metadata. And this allows us to skip files um, without actually touching them. And apparently this boosts the performance of highly selective queries. And the index is also part of the table. It's updated atomically, so you don't have to run a separate system for this and make sure that they are kind of in the consistent state. Um, this also kind of, all of this allows us to um, execute highly selective queries, even on tables with pathways of data in under five seconds overall time. And even more, you can downgrade your clusters and save on resources, still kind of keeping the same level of performance. Um, if you like ignore Iceberg for now, so if, if you tr consider traditional workload, then in the worst case you do, I mean, in the best case you do partition pruning. And once you know which partitions you have to touch, you need to basically touch every single data file um, in, that, in that partition. So you create a Spark task, the Spark task in the best case will uh, will read the footer of your parquet file, will look at the row group metadata information, see the uh, min-max statistics, it will check the dictionary page, and after that it will say you that this file doesn't actually match. Uh, so you will not be processing that file even now, but the most important part is not to trigger that extra task and not to read that footer to basically be able to pre-filter that file. And on average, this has an extra penalty of one second for false positive uh, for a false um, uh, data file. Um, Iceberg also supports implicit partitioning, and today, data engineers they have to produce physical partition values, and uh, users must be aware of that, and they must append them to their queries in order to benefit from partition pruning, uh, and um, in Iceberg, we have a different approach. So in Iceberg, the partitioning is a logical transformation based on your data column. And whenever you have predicate on your data column, we will derive the partition value for you and we will use that to prune the partitions. Um, so this decoupling from the physical representation to the logical representation actually allows Iceberg uh, to have a number of benefits. Some, some of them, for example, include the ability to evolve the partitioning scheme over time. So for example, you may start a table and you partition by date, but up to two years, the size of the data grows and you actually want to consider hourly partitions as well. And you can absolutely find do this in Iceberg and keep the, the old data unchanged. So you don't have to copy this eagerly. You may choose to do this, uh, but uh, it's up to you. So you can still um, keep the old data with the old partitioning and produce new data in the new partitioning uh, scheme, and that will work just fine. Um, also, Iceberg finally sol solves the schema evolution problem. Uh, it assigns um, every column a unique ID and tracks it in the metadata in different parts of it. Um, so you no longer have limitations of tracking columns by position or by name. Um, so you can safely add, drop, rename, reorder columns and, and do all those operations according to the spec. And what is really, really important is that you don't have to rewrite the data for this and there is no side effects. So if you delete a column from a table and then after a year you add a column with the same name, the old data will not appear again. Um, and this is again a very important point for us. Um, Iceberg supports both streaming and batch use cases. Uh, 
uh, we have the Spark structure streaming rights for more than a year right now. So you can uh, build end-to-end -end exactly one's pipelines with Iceberg as a sim. And right now we are about to merge the PR for replayable source, which you can use in your structure streaming pipeline as well. This will allow you to build pipelines uh, between Iceberg tables and Spark. Um, and they, again, will be exactly one's uh, pipelines. One feature that I really like as a developer is that Iceberg has a very rich support for metadata tables. They allow you to analyze the, the table state to add like every detail about the table. You can see the table history, how it evolved over time, which operations happened. You can see statistics for every commit, so how many records you changed, how many data files you added. Um, you can actually like, Every time you have to debug something or every time I have to analyze what the table in its optimal state, I go to the metadata tables and I can pre-compute the average size, uh, the average data size per partition, the data distribution, the number of snapshots, all of that using my, uh, my notebook or Spark job. And also we use those metadata tables internally. For example, which partitions were modified from a given point in time. And th that way we can actually trigger compaction in those partitions specifically. In order to truly benefit from Iceberg, you have to maintain your tables. And therefore Iceberg has connections API, uh, which for now lets you optimize metadata and uh, do beam packing. You also have utilities to explore your alt snapshots and remove orphan files. And we are in the process of building SQL commands as well that will let you um, execute those actions through a SQL API, which is uh, very useful for data engineers as well. There is a design doc, by the way, on that. So just feel free to check the, the community things. Um, another really important point for adoption is the migration story. Uh, so it's not okay to just copy over the, the, the exabytes of data into something, something different. Uh, we definitely wanted to support migration of existing data sets in place. And Iceberg already has utilities for this, but you have to use uh, Java or Scala code for that. Um, internally, we have snapshot and migrate commands, and we are also delivering and contributing that to the uh, upstream in the nearest future as well. Snapshot allows you to create a snapshot of an existing Spark or Hive table and create an iceberg table for testing. So the iceberg table will be created in a totally different location and you can actually write to that table in iceberg, but the results will not be visible in your original table. So it gives you a safe playground to play um, with the existing data set. And once you're done with the testing, you can actually call migrate and this will, this will migrate your existing table in place without any ETL jobs and up to that point, you can actually continue your pipeline, but now you have to write to Iceberg. So I want to also touch upon some of the exciting features that we are working right now. Um, there is a lot of progress on row level updates and deletes. So we had a separate session early today. Uh, so I definitely encourage you to check that out. If you missed it, there will be recording. Uh, but a quick summary that um, Iceberg will support multiple ways to perform updates and deletes, and this will allow you to cover all analytical use cases. Um, we will support copy and write for bulk updates, and we will support merge and read um, for write heavy use cases. And merge and read can be either positional or equality, giving you the, the, the best flexibility uh, you can actually have. And copy and write, We've been running this internally for a year. Uh, merge and read is still in, the, in progress, so we've completed most of the uh, most of the work uh, in terms of the table format. What is missing is the part logic, Spark logic, and uh, minor and major compaction. So that should be available till the end of the year. Um, also, we are working on enhanced data compaction in Iceberg. Uh, so internally, we have different ways to apply data compaction. Um, the most straightforward way is just to perform beam pack, where you take small files and you write bigger files. But the problem that it doesn't really help to restore the distribution of the data, and it doesn't help the min-max indexing in Iceberg. So we have one more option is to 
globally shuffle the records within the files you bin pack. That way you kind of slightly restore the distribution of the data and then you can pre-filter the data more efficiently, which uh, means that your queries will be faster. And then at some points, even if you bin pack a lot of files with optional sorting, the, the overall distribution of data um, within the partition may not be optimal. So we also have ways to fully resort partitions. And this gives you kind of a very flexible way to address the data compaction problem. And what is really important is that data compaction is still asset compliant. And you can run this in the background. And you don't need to stop your um, ingesting pipelines and, and so on. And we're actually contributing this to Iceberg as well. There is a design bug. So I expect that to be available in the near future as well. Also, there are um, talks about secondary indexing in Iceberg. And we wanted to have a proper way to build arbitrary secondary indexes uh, to speed up the execution even more. And one of such ideas is to have a Bloom filter profile. And the important part is that you will be able to load that Bloom filter from the metadata um, and on demand apparently, and then use it for filtering the data without actually touching data files. So with that, I would like to finish with key takeaways and I'll probably hand this over to Vishwan. Before we can hear you. Sorry, <laughs> I was on mute. Thanks, Anton. Uh, I think uh, as a summary, um, Successful disaggregation uh, needs efficient and reliable data lakes here. Um, there are a few questions that have come about uh, disaggregation. I'll address it in, when we start about questions. Um, uh, Iceberg enables data lakes with open data architecture. The most important thing here is to make sure that we are not vendor locked in. Uh, it uses open data formats like Parquet, ORC, and Avro. It's an open data architecture. It's all completely uh, open source that people can contribute towards. Uh, finally, fast queries, asset transaction, and reliable upserts is what makes it really invincible, actually. So we, we, we went with three uh, main core principles on which we are trying to build the data platform. And all these three things are, are um, um, met by Apache Iceberg here. Um, next slide, hang on. We're also hiring, so please check out our uh, internship opportunity, opportunities and full-time opportunities here. We have a Slack channel as well. We'll be in booths uh, to answer some of the additional questions too. I think we have a couple of minutes. Let me um, take a few of the questions here and then um, we, can, um, we can end once that's done. Uh, I think the first question here is, wh what made you choose uh, Apache Iceberg over Delta? Uh, uh, to begin with, there are a lot of reasons that we have had a doc documentations which, which kind of compare both these products. To begin with, Iceberg, uh, Iceberg slightly predates Delta. Um, the second most important aspect, at least from my perspective, is uh, Delta Lake is a part of Databricks um, uh, Enterprise uh, edition of Spark. And, uh, uh, and, and that kind of uh, means that there, won't, there are certain features that will never be open source. It may be related to Z ordering and some of the other features that Delta today provides. Uh, and rightly so, because that's how Databricks is able to provide an enterprise edition which people can buy, basically. So some of these optimizations that Databricks has internally would never be available to everybody else. It's a different model with Iceberg. Everything that's that we have today, we would be first contributing out to Iceberg. It's, it's open to everybody. And um, um, the features like uh, multi-dimensional clustering, ZR ring, uh, and and few others are going to be available for everybody in Iceberg. So that way, it's more open source than Databricks Delta Lake. So why we chose Apache Iceberg? It's it's an open uh, data architecture and definitely open source for all the features that we are currently building. There are some minor other differences, like uh, Delta today doesn't support merge on reads. Um, we are adding support for merge on reads. It's only copy on writes um, um, that Delta supports today. Uh, the next question is about Hoodie. Uh, Anton, do you want to take the question on, on the differences between Apache Iceberg and Hoodie? Right, so uh, even to add to the Delta discussion, so apart from those, uh, 
like models that we were described, there are also other technical reasons. So if you go back to the presentation and you want to compare whether you can get the same features in, in other projects, then it would probably be a good, uh, it will give you a good idea about what's supported, what's not supported. So I would really encourage you to check out each project individually, compare their design, uh, see what you can do and what's the potential of that, what's happening there. With respect to Hoodie, um, I think there are a couple of uh, problems with Hoodie. I think not all of the operations are asset compliant. And also, if you take a look at the merge and read implementation, it is limited to upstairs by a predefined key. So you have to know the key you are updating by um, in uh, basically at the time of the creation of the table, which is not that, that flexible. And we have a separate talk where we describe what are the requirements we have for upstairs and what is the plan to do this in Iceberg. And that kind of kind of completes that picture with respect to the comparison. Cool. Uh, I think the next question we have is about disaggregation. Uh, what about data lo locality and its potential performance cost and uh, network costs? Um, I think we have addressed this uh, as part of several talks that we have done before. Um, we started our journey to provide data platform back in 2017. Uh, it became, it, it went live in 2018. Um, one of the first things that we did at Apple was to see uh, how people are doing analytics. How is the data engineering being done? What's the layout of data? What data formats are, are being used? Um, and one thing that became very evident was that um, we, we had these huge clusters with about 1,500 to 2,000 node clusters. Um, the compute that the placement of compute is not often on the same data nodes that where the data exists. So locality was somewhat of a myth because you the network layout simply meant that you would go up to 7K switches and then back to the compute nodes where the compute was actually running. So as so the first thing that you notice in large organizations is if there is uh, X amount of data. Um, the data that you have stored on, on Hadoop clusters, the compute needs is usually 3x amount of what is available along with that storage in that Hadoop cluster. So naturally what you would do is you would run compute somewhere else or you would copy data over to somewhere else and then run compute on it. So that leads to data proliferation. Copying of data means that you need um, uh, data engineering efforts, you need jobs that would copy data back and forth. You use the CP-like features. That makes it very, very hard to do data governance, basically. So as the data grows, the compute needs simply just explode, and it's impossible to get data locality, even if you're using Hadoop clusters, basically. With respect to network cost, network is becoming cheaper and cheaper, and the networks that we have at Apple are extremely fast, and that allows us to basically copy data between these different availability zones. And the last point here is we have to be smart about which data that we read, and there's no smarter software than Spark and Apache Spark and Iceberg to make sure that you only touch the data that you need and don't try to read a lot of data. While Spark only reads the partitions and files that it actually needs, Iceberg completely nullifies the need for doing lists and need for having to have any additional indexes. So both of these together makes it extremely possible to have disaggregated architecture. It simply becomes cost prohibitive if you were to stand up a lot of Hadoop clusters otherwise. So that's how it can basically expand out. Um, I think uh, there's another question here. Um, uh, can you expand more on implicit partitioning? Is there some query optimization after Spark, Presto, et cetera, does its optimizations? Uh, right, so I think the, the answer is twofold to this question. So uh, implicit partitioning is the same way to achieve partitioning pruning, but in a more user-friendly way. So with the current way of partitioning, you have to know how the table is partitioned. You know the actual partition value, and even in all your queries, you actually have to append the predicate in that partition uh, column. In many cases, that is an artificially produced value, right? And some, some, someone who created the table, he thought about how the table must be partitioned and then produced an extra column, which represents your partition value. And it somehow derives from one of the data columns. In, uh, in Iceberg, it's fundamentally different. So Iceberg itself keeps a logical transformation from the data column to the, log to the partition value. So it actually does not produce that physical partition value. It, it, it figures that out when you query, hmm, 
let's say you have a timestamp uh, timestamp column and you want to partition it by day. Uh, so in Spark, you would have to create a separate column called day and then use it as a partition value. And whenever you query by timestamp, you would actually have to append an additional predicate. Um, so you'd have to derive that again value for, 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 for the day and then use that an additional predicate. In Iceberg, that additional predicate is optional. So Iceberg will see that the table is partitioned by day. You have a predicate on the timestamp. I will figure out what day you have and it will apply that logical transformation and will do implicit partitioning for you. Now, apart from that, um, it also has file filtering. This is using the min-max statistic that's available in the metadata. So traditionally in Spark, you can prune partitions, but you cannot prune files within those partitions. And this is something that really allows you to scale down your clusters and even improve the performance. This is what Vishwa was talking about, which makes it way more efficient in terms of the cost and query times. Thank you. Um, I think we are almost out of time. Uh, thanks a lot for joining and for uh, all the wonderful questions here. Uh, please uh, reach out to us. There are multiple full-time and internship opportunities that we have. Check out Iceberg for sure. Um, uh, raise PRs in open source Iceberg and Spark. We are big users of both of them. Uh, uh, we are at our booths as well. If you have any further questions, please join us there. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye-bye.